Hello. Hello. So, well, that was fantastic. Thank you so much to our wonderful speakers. And we've heard uh, about Morocco. We've heard about uh, Hungary, Japan, um, and the US. And we can open up the floor to a little bit of discussion. I'm going to use my privilege as chair to ask a question before anyone else gets the chance, um, because we're running to time and we have plenty of time to ask questions. Uh, a lot of the issues that we seem to have been discussing seem to come down to um, misconceptions, crude generalizations, stereotypes uh, that pertain to communities of people who use drugs, um, especially in the context of Japan. You know, we heard these notions that are, that are very much built on these sort of, um, well, very sort of outmoded and outdated understandings, very stigmatizing. And in Hungary also, there's this, uh, this populism um, that very much plays on these stereotypes in order to scapegoat a community. Whilst in the US, we've got this conservatism that, it, and in spite of this, um, you've been describing instances, very, very positive instances, and being able to, to, to change things and change the discourse and um, change, challenge the dominant discourse, really, through, through these pragmatic narratives. So, so I really want to um, maybe uh, uh, Peter and um, Emma can talk a little bit about uh, maybe how we can amplify the voices of these communities to a greater extent, how we can um, bring the voices of these communities and the lived realities of, of our communities uh, to bear upon the people who make these decisions and make the policies. <laughs> um, okay, well, the thing that's coming to mind for me is um, a lot of the work that we've done from a capacity building point of view um, in some of these new areas is helping people to identify the, ch the champions within their communities that people will look to and, and like if, oh, if that, if that um, you know, uh, chief of the police department or that doctor or that particular community member or that church leader is willing to engage with harm reduction, that it then f other people see them as leaders in their community so they then become kind of willing to kind of that community get that community backing and buy-in. Um, so I think that's some, some of the work that we've uh, um, supported people to do and, and to help them think outside the box a little about who those people might be in their communities. Um, you know, um, I remember in West Virginia, there's, um, there's a story, there's a woman who works in a particular community. She's, she's an elder of the community and she gives out food and stuff and, she's, um, and people know her very well in the community and they, they identified that she could potentially be a champion for harm reduction because they thought she would be you know, amenable to the message. Um, and so that's one, one way. I don't know if that helps to answer the question. Mm. Yeah, so helping people to really think through who those champions could be. In, in, in my region, in the central part of Europe, is that the, the, the organizing of drug user communities is very undeveloped or it's not advanced at all. Uh, unlike in, for example, in Eastern Europe where the, there, there, there is global fund, that th those countries are eligible for global fund, and global fund is, you know, targeting and addressing uh, uh, community organizing. And in Western Europe there is a quite advanced drug user movement, but in, 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 cent in the central part of Europe you don't find any organizations of people who use drugs, or very, very few uh, community activists, so that's, that's, that's missing. And uh, of course my organization is not a service provider and we are not a community-based organization, we are an advocacy organization, but with our tools we try to amplify their voices and uh, as, as you know we, 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 we make videos and uh, we train also activists to uh, to, to, to make their own videos and uh, uh, for example uh, our latest uh, feature long documentary The Day in the Life uh, was uh, uh, filmed in seven cities of the world and uh, we featured one day of a drug user in each of these cities and uh, uh, one of the scenes was Budapest and we uh, featured a couple uh, uh, two people use drugs and uh, they are injecting new psychoactive substances so through this video making we can we could show that uh, the, the problems of these people and we could give them a voice which they don't have and in, in also in Hungary there is a racial dimension of 
drug use, like most of the injecting drug users belong to the Roma minority, so it's a bit similar to uh, to the U.S. situation. So the, these communities live in poverty, and uh, so it's 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 not only you know the problem of amplifying the voice of drug user communities, but these communities in general, like they are you know. Uh, uh, like they, they really don't have a voice in any kind of public discourses. They don't have access to very, very basic health care. So it's, uh, I think, uh, it's, it's not only the question of, 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 uh, of, of the drug user communities, but it's, it's a much, much more. Uh, you, you, should, you should start it in a much more basic level. You know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions from our audience? We've got some time. Yes, right at the back. How do we do this with a the microphone? There are some in the aisles, I think. Or so. So if you could just come down to the to the microphone to ask your question. There's one to the left and one to the right. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's on. Um, thanks very much, uh, Chairperson. I am from South Africa. Uh, I work for, for an organization called Lifeline. Um, my, just before I get to the question, perhaps as a word of advice uh, for Chairperson, please avoid doing that in the future. When you're chairing meetings, you're not supposed to be the first one who's asking questions. <laughs> Because you know, you know what it does. With the type of questions that you're asking, loaded as, as, as it sounded, it actually says uh, to the audience, I mean, you take, you're even taking some of the questions that we, I was hoping to be asking. So what it does is it's actually, it, it actually renders me very passive in a meeting. And you'll not be surprised in your meetings in the future if you continue this way, you start seeing people walking out of your meetings. Rather, wait for everybody to start asking questions right at the end. If you still have questions, summarize, ask questions right at the end, but ultimately, you know, so that at least you have participation from everybody. Many thanks. It's, 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 it's <laughs> Many it's thanks for your feedback. Yes. yes. The, the Hungary, um, when you spoke about um, government that's anti-harm uh, reduction, I just want to, wanted to check, uh, what is, what is the, the, the attitude of the, what, what is the attitude of the, of, the, of, the, of the opposition to government? Have you got opposition parties to the current governing party? Uh, perhaps is it not a fight which you should be actually trying and approaching the involvement of political parties because if you, you kept on spoke, talking about the, this current government being populist. And we all know governments thrive on populism. And if you've got um, opposition parties opposing the current government, they would want to leverage on, on, on that type of a proposition. And perhaps they would also want to use it for their own political advantage, selfish political advantage. But at the same time, there's a greater benefit for you in that regard because you're soliciting support whilst they're going to be using it for their uh, political, narrow political gains. But at the same time, you'll be achieving what you're hoping to achieve. So I'm saying what, 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 what could be the possibility? I don't know the political system there. I don't know the government system there, but I'm just thinking. I mean, from where I, ca I come from, Africa, South Africa in particular, so we've got uh, political parties and all of that. So I would know that once you approach it in that way, it's going to make it much easier for you to ultimately have a much more bigger voice. Because uh, government, um, government, government, governments, they have power because they have access to resources. So they'll always silence your voice. You just have to find other ways of doing it. Yeah, but, but I just want to get what is the attitude in that regard. But secondly, the, 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 the report of, of the ombudsman, you mentioned it now, and you said, uh, right at the end, you said the ombudsman supports your demands. What was the report? I did not get a sense of the contents of the report. What were the findings of the ombudsman in support of, uh, of your argument in that case? Because once, they are in, once you are saying right at the end of your presentation, you said they support your demands. But I did not get a sense of what was the report and the outcome of that type of a, of a process, if I can get that. But um, 
the, 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 the people, you, you went around and there was a petition and people had to sign the petition to ratify the petition. I, I'm interested in the numbers. Uh, you mentioned 1,700. What is the crater affected population? I'm not talking in fe uh, the ones that are the, the users themselves. Mm -hmm. Perhaps in a, in a community where you were, you know, taking this petition around, I mean, what number are we talking of? You're talking of, uh, for an example, 20,000 people that you only ultimately were able to secure, 1,700. I'm just making an example. I just want to get a sense. But also, the, the, the issue of um, right now when you responded to what he was asking, you said uh, there, there seems to be a lack of uh, you know, awareness because the, the affected population uh, does not necessarily understand the issues similarly um, in, in your instance in comparison to you know, other parts in Europe. But I'm saying you know, in your campaigns, when, when, when you campaign, perhaps um, the, are, are you not looking at basically you know, instead of um, trying to have people supporting you ultimately, what are you doing to, to capacitate them? What are you doing to create a greater awareness? Just before you can even try and look for support from them, what are you doing to, to, to you know, to, to instill that sense of self in them so that ultimately they're able to, to come to the party when it comes to your campaigns? Do you understand, you know, what, what, what are the mechanisms that you've employed in place to make sure that the very people that you're hoping to attract in your campaigns are capacitated to a point where they have a full understanding of all of these issues so that ultimately they are able to be in, in support of all of these campaigns. You don't start by just mobilizing them when you want to campaign, but you start right at the beginning where there's enough you know, awareness and everything. I just want to get a sense of that if you are embarking on that or, or, or on those <coughs> things. Um, should I go to the next speaker? I have. Yeah, if we could just, yeah, if, if, if we give Peter a chance to answer some of those multitudinous questions and then maybe we can move on to somebody else. <laughs> yes. Go ahead, Peter. So, what was the first question? Uh, the first question was uh, uh, about uh, uh, political parties, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't want to discuss the Hungarian political situation long, but. Uh, we have a very weak and fragmented opposition in Hungary. Uh, actually, we did make some, uh, you know, dialogues or partnerships with some of the local politicians because this is, you know, local policy making. So there is like a local council this, which, which was discussing our, uh, uh, our. Uh, we submitted a, a recommendation to the local council, and the local council discussed that, and it was supported by all, actually, all the opposition parties. So we did, I think we, we did a good job in that sense that we convinced all the opposition parties, liberals, socialists, and, uh, and the Greens. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, the government party has the majority, so they voted down our, our uh, proposal. Uh, uh, th I think there is also a danger, though, that, uh, you know, when, when your issue is too much politicized, it, 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 you know, it becomes a very much party political question. So... Uh, so it's it's like a very delicate issue when you tr when you try to approach the politicians. Then I think the second question was about the ombudsman's report. Uh, so we submitted a complaint to the ombudsman of the uh, civil liberties. So we we complained about shutting down the needle exchange programs in these two districts of Budapest, and we claimed that uh, shutting down needle exchange programs is a violation of the right to health, and it's a violation to the right to, to healthy environment of people. And the ombudsman agreed, and uh, he made an investigation. So he you know interviewed all the uh, affected parties, and he made an investigation in the local scene, and then he made a statement. Unfortunately, the ombudsman's uh, positions are not legally binding, so uh, it's more like you know uh, uh, a kind of guiding document. And he recommended local policymakers to reopen the needle exchange programs, but the mayor rejected the uh, the, the ombudsman report. And actually, he accused uh, us, my, my organization, to manipulating the ombudsman. So it was a very uh, dirt, uh, dirty debate after that. And um, yeah, uh, with the local. Communities, how, how we make them interested or committed. 
uh, yeah, which we, what we do it is we, 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 we try to build up, you know, some coalitions with some local groups, like who, who has their own cases. For example, you know, home, uh, some, some advocacy organizations fighting homelessness or helping homelessness, uh, uh, some groups who are helping, you know, the Roma people or the s uh, uh, other, you know, uh, vulnerable communities. And we tried, you know, to, 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 to train them and educate them about about this problem, and we try to create co local coalitions, and 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 this this is how we try to reach out people. And I think uh, uh, we uh, reached out a very significant part of this uh, pop local population. Um, I think we are talking about a few, like uh, maybe 30, 40,000 people who, who live in this uh, uh, area. So uh, that uh, so we, we we collected like thousands of signatures. The the number you saw it was only the offline signatures. So we also have collected off online signatures, and uh, these signatures were you know like supporting our proposal, which we submitted to the local council. So that was the significance of the of collecting signatures that it is backed by local citizens. So yeah, I, I hope I could answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, go ahead. Hi, so uh, my name is Alex McMadoo. Hi. And uh, my question is for Emma Roberts. So your work in the rural US sounds really incredible. I would love to rack your brain sometime. But uh, my uh, primary question is um, if you have thoughts on how to expand access to OST in rural communities. You know, that's one of the things we hear time and time again, right? That um, there's this um, push, you know, um, for people to be in treatment, um, but then there isn't the treatment available. Um, so, yeah, I mean, again, it's something that, uh, you know, and just as Peter was talking about local coalitions, part of the capacity building work and helping people to come together to advocate and build and develop programming has been to. Um, help them advocate not just for harm reduction, but the, well, the holistic part of mm -hmm. harm reduction. So it's not, you know, the syringe is the engaging people, but it's everything else that we do around that for people and provide them with all these other services, including OST. Um, the other thing that we've seen that's been super helpful most recently in the US um, is in the abstinence of some t of of say methadone treatment facilities, um, we now have uh, medical providers that can provide suboxone. Um, so that's been really helpful. So for example, in Austin, Indiana, mm -hmm. um, where there is a, a big shortage of treatment um, available, uh, Will Cook, the doctor there, the local community doctor that is seeing the majority of the patients with HIV, has actually got himself um, registered to provide suboxone as well. And also luckily the government um, prior to the new administration, passed rulings that um, doctors can have more patient capacity because originally it was 30 in your first year and a, something like 100 in your second. And then also they've changed the rules so that nurse practitioners and physician assistants can also provide suboxone. So that's increasing the capacity to provide some treatment services. But it's definitely something, you know, in rural areas that people really struggle with. Um, you know, there may be a treatment facility, but geographically, because people are so spread out, they can't get there, or there just isn't that provision. So I think it's, yeah, I mean, it's a tough one, but it's definitely something that we include in terms of the conversations with communities about their development there. So hope that's helpful. Totally. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, go ahead, please. Okay. Good afternoon. My question is to any one of the panelists and is regarding harms reduction and politics. And I will take two examples. In 1962, the Supreme Court of the United States stated that addiction was a disease and not a crime. Despite that, the United States is one of the most repressive countries in terms of drugs. The second example before my question is the example of South Africa. Many years ago, the South African government hired Dr. Peter Drisberg from California, who said that AIDS was not related to HIV, and therefore the policies in terms of HIV in South Africa were different from other parts of the world. I'm taking those two examples to illustrate the differences between countries in terms of harm, harm reduction and politics. Don't you think 
that an organization like the United Nations should take position to, to bring a global perspective in terms of harm reduction? Thank you. Who would like to answer that? We start with you, Peter. Actually, actually we, 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 we try to do that. Like we invited officials from the United Nations, uh, eight of, uh, uh, UN AIDS and the UN ODC, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, and they came. We organized a conference where they presented the joint uh, UN AIDS, UN ODC, WHO position on harm reduction and best practices. And our government listened, and then they went home, and they continued as they did before. So they did not. They, in, in my country, you know, the government does not listen to the United States and the United Nations. And if you look at the Philippines, for example, you know, even if there was like a very strong uh, condemnation from UN agencies of what uh, the president is doing there, like killing people, uh, the 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 president of the Philippines just doesn't care about it. So it's like. As I said in, uh, in my presentation, in the European Union, the European Union also has a, dr a drug strategy, and the Hungarian government signed it. But when it comes to implementation, they just you know disregard it, and that's like kind of limit of of, of this big global multilateral uh, 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 treaties and uh, and 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 papers. Like they they maybe exist, but but in the local scene, the realities are very very different. So I, 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 that's my opinion that, that it, it, it has a very limited uh, uh, role what, what these international organizations can play in this local level. I mean, in terms of, in terms of this international infrastructure and to what extent it comes to bear on the situations in country, it might be interesting to hear about the situation in Japan where you spoke about um, ideas of... Uh, uh, society um, being elevated to such an extent that the individual ceases to... So maybe in, in relation to this question, do you think um, okay. these international agreements would come to bear? Um, yeah, uh, it, it will be very big that if the UN changes their attitude, but at the same time I'm also not so I cannot be so optimistic because even maybe even said maybe just recommendation or they cannot force the countries to do like that. So maybe because even now it's like a broad consensus. So mm -hmm. some in the under this convention, some countries do decriminalization and some countries do punitive approach. So if it changes, still it's maybe broad consensus stays. And but it's it must be much easier for us to you know. Um, promote harm reduction act, uh, advocacy. So that's the reason we translate a lot of materials from WHO or UN ODC, because if we say, I'm social worker or I'm NGO, why don't you do decriminalization? People don't hear from us. But if we say it's not from us, it's from WHO, it's from UN, then more people can you know, take consideration of it. So I kind of, I want to also take advantage of that. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, over here. Sorry, my apologies. Oh, my, my sincerest apologies. Sorry, you first and then you. My apologies. That's I okay. didn't see. I was wondering what policies or procedures um, are being done for women uh, in general uh, in any of these countries as well. I just want, want to know in what kind of position or... Um, things are being done on the, on the ground for women in general in any of these countries. Sorry, in terms of women who use drugs or? or who use drugs, need harm reduction. Um, what's, what's being done for them? C'est une question très intéressante. Donc, euh, en général, euh, je donne l'exemple du Maroc. Euh, depuis qu'on a démarré le premier programme d'échange de seringues de réduction des risques en 2007, on lutte pour avoir des programmes destinés à la femme, vu que la femme est les plus stigmatisée et les plus marginalisée par rapport à ses donc, collègues euh, hommes. De toute façon, donc, les, les services existants actuellement, ce sont des services destinés à toute la population des usagers de drogue, sans faire la distinction 
sans prendre en considération les besoins spécifiques liés aux femmes. Même les, stru les structures d'accueil, de prise en charge, sont faites pour accueillir la totalité des de la population. Il n'y a même pas les services destinés à, aux femmes avec les enfants. Donc déjà, ça, 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 euh, ça donne vraiment des difficultés par rapport euh, à la prise en charge des femmes qui, euh, dans la, la, la plupart des cas, euh, n'ont pas le temps pour euh, se présenter selon les, hor les horaires d'ouverture des, des, des centres avec les enfants. Et on nous semble toujours dans la lutte pour avoir vraiment une politique qui respecte le genre et qui respecte la spécificité de la femme. Vu que nous, dans notre culture, dans notre société, sans la présence de ces programmes, de ces politiques, il est vraiment difficile d'assurer une vraie prévention pour les femmes usagères de drogue et aussi de, de réussir la prise en charge des femmes et leur réinsertion professionnelle. Would anybody else like to speak on this? No? Yeah. I mean, so I'm glad you asked. That. Ooh. <laughs> from a yeah, from a capacity building um, point of view, um, when we're working with um, programs and people that are new to harm reduction, that's part of the conversation: is how you're going to cater for spe specific uh, populations that may have greater vulnerabilities. Women is one of them. So, you know, we would talk about them about you know how are you going to cater if women have children? How are you going to create spaces that, you know, some of our programs in New York, for example, have women-only times that pick women can come. So helping people to think that through, I think, is really important, you know, to understand the additional um, disproportionate impact th that women face in terms of the stigma around their drug use. Um, it's really interesting for me, um, you know, because what we're seeing at the Harm Reduction Coalition is a lot more newer audiences coming to us. So we've been asked to go to Alabama, uh, sorry, to Texas, sorry, I get my perspective. We've been asked to go to Texas, which is a very, you know, thought of as a very conservative state around this stuff, to speak to uh, people who are working with women impacted by NAS, neonatal abstinence syndrome, because they want to apply harm reduction in terms of engaging pregnant women. So that's really hopeful that, you know, people, new audiences that perhaps weren't thinking about harm reduction in the past are now beginning to see that there's opportunities to engage particularly women and pregnant women in a, in, a, in a better way to get them into services. So we're slowly making, you know, those little steps forward in relation to, uh, you know, impacting issues for women. So that's, that's just from my experience that I've seen in my work. So. And, you know, just being more int int intentional in our intersectionality around, you know, reproductive rights, um, you know, and working with people like, you know, National Advocates for Pregnant Women, we've done work with them as well to kind of do that intersection with harm reduction and other, uh, other uh, public health issues, so. Um, so in my country, uh, the policy itself is kind of, say, it's, nothing difference between male and female, but of course in the society, in the reality, it's totally, you know, there's a big gap because it, we have a very, very male-oriented society and culture. So, but uh, my colleagues who are working together, I mean, say I just we have three members, including me, and two of them are female. One is a mother of the, uh, mother who have a daughter who has struggling with, you know, using drugs. Uh, and the other one is she is, herself is a uh, um, recovering, People, uh, people who you know use drugs, and so they have a very very severe experiences as a people who use drugs as a family member at the same time as a female in the society. So they they have they kind of always think like a, they are very repressed and try to do something. So we that kind of the women the gender perspective is very very important for our advocacy activities. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. We just had one more question over here. And this will be our last question. Thank you. Une question. Bonjour, je m'appelle Moulay Hamdouridi. Je suis du Maroc. Je m'occupe dans une association de lutte contre le sida, du plaidoyer et des droits humains. Et mon Maroc marque, c'est concernant ce que les collègues ont, ont dit concernant les, les agences ou les instruments onisiens et surtout les instruments qui sont en relation avec les droits humains. Je crois qu'il faut donner beaucoup de l'importance, maintenant, dans cette phase de notre plaidoyer d'ici 2019, à tout ce qui est en relation avec ces instruments unisiens de droits humains. Tout d'abord parce qu'on peut jouer 
sur ces instruments et surtout sur les rapports de ces instruments. Par exemple, le dernier rapport qui a été euh, recommandé par euh, le Haut Commissariat aux droits humains par le Conseil international des droits humains sur les impacts de la politique de la drogue sur la santé et qui était en notre faveur, en notre plaidoyer. Mais on ne l'a pas utilisé suffisamment à l'UNGAS 2016. Donc maintenant, il faut qu'on... C'est-à-dire, comme il l'a dit notre ami, il faut un peu de renforcement de capacité de nos acteurs en matière de droits humains, en matière de plaidoyer avec les outils de, euh, de droits humains, avec tout ce qui est dans les conventions. Parce que ces conventions, ce sont des contrats entre les pays. Et il faut qu'on utilise ces contrats. Donc, je crois que dans notre plaidoirie, que ce soit plaidoirie locale, régionale ou internationale, il faut donner beaucoup de l'importance à tous ces instruments et les utiliser. Merci. When, when we were uh, you know, preparing for the United Nations General Assembly special session on drugs, which you know, was last year in uh, April in New York City, uh, one of the key recommendations of civil society was to create a, a special you know, human rights assessment system inside the UN drug agencies and inside, for example, the World Drug Report. We recommended to have a special chapter on the uh, assessment of human rights and the, the impact of drug policies on the human rights of uh, people who use drugs. So that was a key recommendation from civil society and which also tried the uh, European Union to champion this issue, to, to you know, to, uh, to uh, uh, make it a part of the uh, UN GAS final document that uh, the UN should create a, a human rights assessment tool. Because there is now there is like no monitoring and no evaluation whatsoever in the United Nations level of the human rights impact of drug policies. So it's like nobody is looking at it. I mean, that you, you mentioned this report, but it's like there is no like systematic uh, coherence in the inside the United Nations system between the, the, the drug control system and the human rights system. So unfortunately, our recommendation was rejected by, by the, even by the European Union, unfortunately. But I think I, I, I very much agree with you that it should be a key you know, point on, on our agenda in the future that uh, we should demand that we need to look at the human rights in, 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 in the context of drug control. All right, so we're just out of time, um, and we ran to time. Thank you so much for such a, a stimulating discussion. I'm sure you'll join me in thanking all of our wonderful speakers. Thank you so much.